So the first presentation this afternoon is by Mustafa Mokrain from the ICSU World Data System, and he's going to be talking about trusted data services for polar research. So let's hope you know how to do this better than I do. Okay, I'll let you. <laughs> Part of the problem is they've got a new uh, touch sensor. That's Good afternoon. Thank you for the introduction, Els. So um, my presentation will be on the ICSU World Data System. And I will try in this presentation to really show you how the World, the world Data System originated in the polar data community and was heavily influenced by the polar uh, research um, agenda. But first, let me um, set some uh, um, set the stage for this presentation by um, talking uh, about the technological developments that many have already uh, mentioned in previous uh, presentations. Um, over the last 70 years and since the, the dawn of the, um, the uh, digital age, um, 70 years ago we've seen the first computers um, um, built and made available for research, um, the first satellites uh, 60 years ago were launched to observe uh, our planet. Uh, we started to use 50 years ago uh, drifting buoys, for example, to study the oceans and, and the weather. And 30 years ago, we had massive increase in the computing power with the first supercomputers made available for research. And since the last 20 years, we have seen the rise of the internet age and now also of mobile technologies. So all of these technical and technological developments have been the backdrop of research over the last 70 years. And they, man and they influenced the way we're doing uh, research and they really introduced what is now called uh, the data intensive science discovery age or the, uh, which was popularized by the, the fourth paradigm uh, um, as all of you know. So all of these sensors we're using in, in research um, have generated a massive volume of data. And we, you've all heard the data deluge uh, metaphor. Um, in my field, because I'm, I'm not a, a polar scientist, I'm a biologist, um, the high throughput sequencing techniques have also dramatically increased data available in terms of DNA sequences. We're building massive telescopes, also generating uh, huge amounts of, of data. All of this data available uh, is allowing us to do very uh, new things like b modeling the climate, which is very important as we know nowadays, and reconstruct past climates as well. Um, it's also now tangibly visible in our databases and data banks. Uh, this is, for example, as you can see here, the rate, the increased rate um, of uh, sequences in the e MBL uh, uh, data bank. This is an exponential increase, and all of this is generating um, uh, new knowledge, and is the increase of, of knowledge, as can be seen here in this graph, with the increase of publications in the medical uh, field is um, uh, um, exploding in terms of, uh, of uh, quantity. So parallel to this, um, these developments, technological developments, and also a shift in the way we're doing research, into this data intensive research, the concept of open data for science emerged. And in fact, it dates back to, um, uh, to uh, more than 50 years ago, and it also emerged in the polar data community. Um, as you all know, and we've heard about it, the International Geophysical Year in 57, 58, when it was launched by its organizers, including the International Council for Science, or mainly the International Council for Science, had this vision that all observation data shall be available to scientists and scientific institutions in all communities. So it really set a precedent for uh, the open data for science. Uh, all of you know that IPY really was across many domains and many disciplines and generated a lot of data. But at that time, the vision was met really in terms of implementation. And the International Council for Science established what was also introduced previously, the World Data Centers, 
but also the, the Federation of Astronomical and Geophysical Data Analysis Services. And these bodies were really tasked to make sure that data are not lost, that they're maintained, preserved for the long term, and accessible. And they also made, as early as in 1955, a recommendation that those data are made available in machine-readable form. So we had already there um, a stage for the open data. Uh, an open, uh, the stage for open data was uh, uh, already there. 30 years, uh, sorry, 50 years after the first, uh, after the IGY came the International Polar Year, um, 2007 and 8, which was also uh, um, uh, holding up to the open data concept. And the assumption at that time was that all of the data generated by this multitude of uh, programs across so many disciplines would eventually end up in a data repository. This worked, as all of you know, uh, um, to a great extent or to some extent with the big data sets generated by well-funded programs, but in fact it didn't work for many of the, the smaller data sets generated by smaller programs and activities. And this actually can be um, <coughs> Very, in a very um, simplified way seen on this uh, diagram here, where if you put the total volume of scientific data um, generated today, so this is not applicable for IPY, but in more general terms, if you put this total volume of scientific data generated today against the fitness for use, um, you can see basically three different parts. In yellow here, what I call the managed open uh, data. These are the data sets where we succeeded in IPY in terms of their uh, preservation. They ended up in um, what, was, what can be called the domain repository or well-funded repository. And they're usually open. And then you have this second part, the green part, what uh, is called labeled here unmanaged open. These data sets are, come with fairly minimal metadata. Um, and they're usually deposited in uh, repositories where they have also no or limited uh, curation and, and long-term preservation. Um, um, the third part, um, and this is uh, what is called now the long tail of the, the, data, set, the, the data sets in science, are m largely unmanaged and closed. So these are the typical data sets sitting in a desktop computer or a, a memory stick somewhere in a lab. And this is what we call now also, jokingly in WDS, the dirty long tail. Um, one of the concerns of the world data system is really to move this part of the dirty long tail into the unmanaged and open, but preferably into the managed open uh, section of, uh, of this graph. So the world data system, uh, going back to uh, my organization, is a membership organization for those who uh, are not familiar with it. It brings together scientific data services, what we call scientific data services, across disciplines. So it's multidisciplinary from the natural sciences to the social sciences and humanities. It was created after IPY, uh, after two, in 2009. But in fact, IPY, IPY, IPY revealed the weaknesses in the previous, the predecessor bodies of, of WDS, the World Data Centers, and the Federation of Data Analysis Services, but also revealed weaknesses in the way the international collaborative science was planned, because data was not a primary concern. It came in many cases after the facts, after the science planning was done. So one of the litmus tests for the success of WDS at that time was really to look at the um, IPY data legacy. When, IP, uh, when WDS was established, it was tasked by the International Council for Science to work towards enabling um, universal and equitable, and by this it was meant full and open access to quality assured scientific data, to ensure the long-term data stewardship and data preservation, of course, to foster compliance to agreed upon data standards and conventions, and to provide also mechanisms to facilitate and improve access to data and, and data products. So this is basically the mandate that was given to uh, the World Data System by the International Council for Science. I mentioned WDS is a membership organization. We have scientific data services. These are organizations providing one or all of the functions listed here. Um, capture, storage, curation, long-term preservation, discovery, access, retrieval, aggregation, etc. So they cover all of the data life cycle, but also 
um, other aspects like the legal frameworks in terms of, uh, uh, in the context of data sharing. WDS is governed by a scientific committee. It's an international group of leading experts in data management. Again, multidisciplinary background here. They've approved the first strategic plan for WDS covering the period 2014-2018. So it's imp being implemented at this, at this, at this time. Um, we have five strategic targets as part of, of this uh, um, strategic plan. First one is to make trusted data services an integral part of international collaborative scientific research. And this is really exemplified in the case of IPY. It is very important that those data repositories, those data service providers are part and involved in the scientific planning from the outset. And this is one of the strategic targets we're pursuing in WDS, making sure that they become really parts of the, the, the scientific planning and they're involved at er, an early stage. Second strategic target is to nurture active disciplinary and multidisciplinary scientific data services communities. And this meeting is one example of the type of activities WDS is involved in, uh, but also in other communities. Recently, we hosted a workshop, for example, with the solar terrestrial communities working uh, uh, on interactions between the sun and earth systems. And we really believe that strong data communities supporting specific domains are our best bet in terms of ensuring that a global uh, um, community can emerge uh, in terms of uh, multidisciplinary uh, data management. Third strategic target is to improve the funding environment for data services. This came across in many presentations before. The funding models behind data repositories and data service providers today are not always adequate. And we have, because of this data deluge and the increased responsibility on them, they, they need to evolve. The funding models, the business models need to evolve and we're working with the research funders to make sure that those business models become compatible with the new responsibilities um, behind uh, or falling on uh, uh, WDS members. Fourth strategic target is to improve the trust in and quality of open scientific data services. The trust here is the keyword, and it, it, ca it came also in, in some of the presentations earlier today, um, and I will give some examples on what we're doing in, in terms of uh, trust. Fifth um, a strategic target, this is to position WDS as a premium global multidisciplinary network for quality um, assessed scientific research data. So this is kind of the overall strategic target. So one example of what WDS in the context of the IPY data legacy um, is trying to do. Um, so the, 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 we noticed that many of the IPY uh, pro related projects um, signed up for the IPY data policy but never made their data sets available. We noticed also that many of um, those projects published papers with underlying data sets, but those data sets were never made available in a trusted digital repository. So WDS decided to work with its members, and in this case with Pangea, a multidisciplinary uh, data repository, and when, with uh, one of our associates, ICSTI, the International Council for Scientific and Technical Information. And ICSTI provided a bibliography um, um, 1,380 papers were identified uh, for be, uh, as being related to an IPY project. Uh, Pangea filtered down this list and managed to uh, salvage 450 articles with valuable data sets and using a workflow they developed um, with a, a, a previous project in the context of data rescue, they were able to salvage 1,270 data sets from those publications. And now these data sets are available in machine-readable form in the Pangea data repository uh, with uh, professionally uh, curated, uh, 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 professionally uh, curated uh, uh, level, I would say. This work has been published in a paper, and I would encourage you to also uh, listen at the panel discussion on data rescue we will have on, uh, on Thursday. Um, hopefully, we'll be, have some time to, to go further um, uh, about this uh, project. But this is typically the ty uh, type of things WDS tried to do to clean the dirty, the dirty long tail. Um, and this is also the type of things we don't want to have in the future, especially in the next IPY. We want to have things in place that would enable us to um, uh, avoid these kind of situations. Um, 
very briefly also, we established the WDS um, certification. Um, is it the red one already? Oh God. <laughs> Okay, I heard, um, uh, I'll, I'll be very quick. So, the trust. Um, when WDS was established in 2009, um, we decided that we need to, set, to, to come up with a catalog of criteria to certify data repositories, to establish um, a seal for trusted data uh, digital repositories. Um, this is based uh, on a, a criteria of catalog, a compilation of uh, international standards and best practices, and you can see here the workflow that all of WDS members have to go through to uh, be certified as a trusted digital repository. Earlier it was mentioned that we're working also with the data seal of approval in the, uh, another similar certification schema that uh, emerged in the social sciences and humanities to try and provide a universal uh, certification for uh, data repositories. I will be very brief else, um, these two more slides. <laughs> so the, member, the current membership of WDS, we have 61 certified regular members. These are your typical data center, standalone data center or data uh, service provider. We have 10 networks already uh, certified as well. These are umbrella organizations, usually international umbrella organizations of groupings of data centers and data uh, service providers. We have five partners and 18 associates. WDS has a global foot footprint through our regular members established in individual countries, but, but most importantly through our network members because they really uh, give us uh, a coverage in countries where we do not have national members. Uh, sorry, where we do not have uh, regular members. If you look at members, regular members with a strong polar interest. Uh, we have several, several of, of them uh, popping up on the map here, um, but not all of them, far from that. Um, we have also some networks with relevance to the polar data, and the good news is that we're working with SCAR, SCADM, and also the IASC Antarctic Data Commi uh, Committee to have them join as network members to improve the co coverage in terms of uh, uh, WDS uh, polar uh, centers. If you want to learn more about WDS, we have a nice website you can visit. The URL is appearing here. I Im invite you to join also our next webinar on the 5th of November. It's on data rescue. This is not a, a, a fixed idea of mine, but it happens uh, uh, as one of the um, focuses, current focuses of WDS. Finally, International Data Week was introduced with um, um, three main events, SciDataCon, the research conference on data science, a one-day international data forum. This will be a multi-stakeholder event and the RDA 8 plenary. Thank you very much and sorry for being over time. <laughs> do, do we have time for questions or I go back? <laughs> we'll have time for one question. Okay, one Up question. There. One question. Ah. Here you go. The mic, please. that you'll promote the adoption of agreed to standards. Um, agreed, could you define agreed to and talk about the domain of standards that you're referring to? So um, these are usually community agreed standards. So whenever we have um, an applying um, data repository or data service provider, um, they, they have to provide an, an application form and uh, answer some of those questions about what type of standards they're using, what type of uh, conventions they adhere to, etc. And this is reviewed by two reviewers. And those reviewers have as a task to check that those standards being used by the data repository are compatible with the community agreed. So it's a case-by-case -case basis. There's no standard that would apply to all. Of course, there are some that we would like them, minimum standards we would like them to adhere to, <laughs> but the more specific community standards uh, are really addressed on a case-by-case -case basis. 